my name is Bob Mel. Um, I'm the founder of an app called Thirst. It's a dating app for queer people of all genders, and my pronouns are they and them, just for a heads up. Um, so I'm going to be talking about imagining radical queer futures through tech, and this is an intertwining of my own personal experiences um, and lived realities, and also just a bit of theory and what I think tech could be. Um, so what is a radical queer future? Um, and I thought about this a lot because I was like, what do I want to see in the platforms and tools that I'm using? Um, and how can I inject myself into just the general web, the general internet and general tech and see myself and feel very affirmed and feel like I'm not parsing myself apart for the various spaces I'm in. Um, so to do all of that, I really had to acknowledge where are we coming from and what tech is currently. Um, the first thing is to acknowledge the colonial impact on the way we create and see spaces and communities. Tech is inherently binary, but I, as I was creating my own dating app, I realized that people aren't. We don't really fit into the platforms we create, and the bias that white men have when creating these tools automatically filters out certain folks. And so I realized as I was growing up, I couldn't adequately see myself because I wasn't intended to be seen in those spaces. Um, historically, there's been a lack of space afforded to marginalized groups, especially queer people of color, yet the content that's created and the folks who are most active on these platforms are queer people of color. So from Twitter and Black Twitter to Instagram and Snapchat, the people who are creating and really driving these platforms are often the most marginalized. And I think that's an interesting dynamic that um, I really want to point out before I start. Um, the platforms were built to create them, and then safety and security were considered as an after effect. So when I sell myself in these platforms, I was like, do I feel safe using these things? Do I feel safe using these tools? And ultimately, what is considered non-essential to people who aren't like me? The end goal for this whole talk is to kind of reach a point where we figure out how do we survive as communities while using tech, and do those two work together? How do we connect and how do we communicate? And ultimately, how does it enhance our lives? So this is me. Um, I'm about 11 here, and this is when I first started engaging with tech. Um, thinking about building software and thinking about hardware as well, and that's a pretty rare experience, I would say, for a lot of marginalized folk. Um, but I realized drastically the difference between what was expected of me and what I expected of myself. And so black and brown young people especially grew up on platforms that are centered around white imagination and white needs. Um, so we're really placed into a space where you're expected to kind of shift and change other industries that really inherently aren't for you. And I think that's a very dangerous dynamic, especially for young people, where we have amazing programs like Black Girls Code and other programs that are asking young black and brown folk to adapt and shift to industries that are inherently made for older white men. Um, so the internet in itself was designed for the people who don't really want us to be there. Um, what does that mean for a generation of young technologists? To be very aware of that bias, to be aware of the places that we're placed in um, and the space that we're meant to create for ourselves. And these are just larger questions that I was milling about when I was thinking about my own history on the internet. Um, so we can only explore limited spaces of the white imaginary, whether it was fa fantasy or gaming sites. Whenever a marginalized group tries to challenge the status quo, we're often lashed out against because that's shifting the way that we are able to access information, but also redefine those spaces. Um, so my entry to that was Neopets, which strangely enough was the most accepting space. <laughs> Um, and I think that's really telling. It's, it was an amazing space, it was very fun, but I was like, you know, for black and brown young kids in my community, we were allowed to access online spaces with like magical cartoons and like a tree that gave us omelets, but <laughs> we couldn't see other black and brown characters in digital spaces. There were no cartoons, there were no games, there were no platforms. And I think that was strange, I think, to grow up and be so invested in fantasy and tech simultaneously and realize that we could have magic, we can have Harry Potter, we can have talking trees, but not black and brown children. And how does that impact how we see the industry as a whole? To expect young black and brown folk to want to invest in an industry that doesn't see them in the beginning as children, and then expect them to shape and change those spaces as adults is deeply false. Inclusion isn't the problem. I think ultimately I realized my whole life has been trying to shift and adapt these spaces to fit me instead of creating my own. Um, so I think tech has a, f a major flaw. It's adapted the American legacy of taking from black and brown content creators, black and brown workers, black and brown people in general as communities, without actually investing in saying, what can they build for themselves and what should we allow them to build for themselves? 
I think the danger is only expecting black and brown people to want to work at companies and not expecting them to want to make their own spaces, their own companies, their own platforms, and their own tools for themselves. I think breaking that colonial dynamic is deeply important because we have a lot of platform issues. Black Twitter is so deeply active, yet Twitter itself filters out the way that we can interact, especially during moments of tension, so social protests, um, political stress, or even just conflict are often filtered, um, and you notice a trend of surveillance. And so that's deeply troubling when you have people trying to connect with each other to either heal or alleviate cultural tension and problems, um, and it's on a platform that inherently doesn't want them to do those things. I think ultimately there's little purpose in inclusion without an actual conversation about what's the next step beyond including people in other spaces. It's ultimately how can we create spaces that affirm those people and where a white supremacist tech industry doesn't need to be involved at all. Can we have an industry where black and brown people are allowed to be separate and siloed to allow themselves to heal and create platforms and tools that actually work solely for them? I think that's an important conversation to have perhaps later on if you want to talk to me about that. Um, despite things being trash, we still make them golden. And I think that's a really amazing thing I've seen across all platforms is the resiliency of marginalized groups, marginalized users who say, this really is harmful, this really isn't great, but I'm still going to make the best use of it. So whether it's women of color using various platforms, women in gaming spaces, queer people of color using Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat, there's always been a moment of resilience and saying, I'm not happy with what exists, but I'm willing to make it better. And I think to acknowledge that all people of color really have enhanced all social media platforms and various tools is key to really realizing the things that we need to do to make our future better. To make it more radical is to acknowledge that there are various folk who influence our culture in general. Apart from just tech culture, the way that we see each other, the way we talk, our slang, our language, our lingo is all input into how we develop programs, platforms, and tools. And so to give people credit for the work that they've been doing is pretty much the first step into shifting how we see users, how we see um, the content space that we're in in general. And ultimately, I think the internet would be less interesting without these amazing memes, right? I mean, <laughs> so how can we radicalize these spaces? I think the first thing, yes, is to hire black and brown folk to develop them. I think we're very much on a long journey where hiring black and brown people is still a conversation. And that's almost baffling to me, but I think it's very real. In order to develop a platform that can adjust and adapt to marginalized people, you need marginalized people making those decisions. To support marginalized people creating their own platforms is definitely the second step in using your post to support them. So saying it's not just important to have black and brown people working with me, but working apart from me on their own things and supporting their own communities. I think that's true power and agency, and really shifting the conversation from always inclusion to support and really thinking about um, retribution in a lot of ways. A lot of capital and access and resource has been taken from black and brown communities. And especially in the tech space, we need to think about how can people use the same tools or create their own tools to serve themselves. Um, ultimately, cis hetero white men need to stop running things. I think historically that hasn't really worked out for us. <laughs> um, and I think for all marginalized people across various backgrounds um, and spaces, to intentionally take up space and just to be present and name your needs. And granted, that does have um, some restriction because it has been very difficult to speak up when people don't want to hear you. Um, but I think making space, so if you're aware that I may not be as marginalized as the person sitting next to me or the other person in the meeting, just being very aware of your dynamic and how you're positioned within your space, work group, or company, and really shifting that to make it arguably more accepting for everyone. One theme I've noticed is that regardless of the platform and how generally rough and shitty tech can be, We've used platforms like Twitter, Tumblr, Snapchat, and Instagram to connect diasporas. So me being a black queer person, I've been able to connect with black people all over the world, apart from language barriers or space barriers, and really bridge those communities that have been divided by colonialism. So connecting with various people who are actually in the Caribbean or in North Africa and really having these conversations about what is happening to our communities, how can we better see each other and connect through tech, who's building what and for what reasons, and why is this necessary? or having a conversation during uh, the Ferguson protests with children in Gaza and saying, what are the commonalities between these two um, tactics and how can we better communicate and support each other, both technically and literally? I think these are all amazing conversations and things that are happening on these platforms, regardless of the intention um, that was put into the original build. I think POC and QPOC automatically subvert 
the initial intention of all these platforms um, to override the limitations that are placed in front of you, irregardless of tech, is just something amazing that needs to be noted. The way that we can really drive the industry forward is to acknowledge the people who have been resilient from the beginning, irregardless of industry or space, to really push forward and say, I have been oppressed, but I'm using the tools and resources I have to create something better. Um, something that industry should be embracing instead of continuing to marginalize various folks who have different lived experiences. I think apart from finding friends online, uh, marginalized people use these white-run spaces to find resources and information and ultimately subvert the police and, uh, police state, but also general state violence. And I think that's another thing to talk about in terms of survival. Um, there have been various protests in the past five to seven years, regardless of the area, but especially in the U.S., um, in various regions of Northern Africa and the Middle East, and I think tech has been a critical part of all of those, and to note that mostly people of color are using these things not just to communicate, but also to really change the way that they are able to live their lives and navigate those spaces outside of uh, oppressive regimes or just dangerous scenarios that have been a result of American imperialism. I think tech has a deep responsibility to acknowledge first the step that it has been, or the position that has been placed in in the world, where people can now use these platforms to connect on a deeper level, but ultimately make long-lasting revolutionary change. And I think the inherent nature of black and brown people using tech is that it will be radical. You're not expected to be on these platforms, you're not expected to be making them, you let alone be part of the discussions. But I think being present and actually being here is a testament alone, yet continuing to build when that hasn't been an expected thing, I don't know. And a larger question I've been really sitting with for a few months actually is what our online home would look like. So what would it actually look like to have a radical tech space that is affirming for all genders, for all backgrounds, for all ethnicities, for all people with different abilities, and to actually have people feel seen. I think the, mar the majority of marginalized people are currently integrated into a larger house of white tech where you're asking people to make space for you. And I think that's a dangerous um, dynamic we have again because who has the power to create space and who is requesting it. Um, to really evaluate that the power hasn't shifted and that automatically makes people feel um, as if they're secondary or less important. And that's something that we really do need to work on if we do declare that our platforms aren't going to be uh, integral into how we change and shape our world. I think how we, I think we need to evaluate how these spaces change the way we interact with each other. I noticed that for marginalized people especially that online spaces can be more dangerous in fact than in life. Um, or in real life experiences, simply because there's a, an element of anonymity and also an element of uh, access, where you're suddenly confronted with the people who may not like you or may not approve of you um, and all in real time. And so we really need to evaluate like, what does safety and security look like on a broader scale when we have marginalized people using these platforms and tools. Um, so ultimately, can we envision liberation online if we have a platform not designed for us and by us? I don't know, that's a larger question, but I think to head in that direction is to ultimately center marginalized people in those discussions around building um, and ultimately developing an ecosystem that is affirming for everyone to speak up and really be present. And I think this is another key example too. I think black folk, especially in tech, are expected to be co-workers and friends <laughs> and entertainment, but we do more than entertain, so we do both. I think it's the beauty of um, really seeing a community is embracing both the radical and uh, the humorous, the light, the complexity of human nature needs to be put into tech again, and I think um, once we fully embrace the core of who we all are, we'll be able to do that. And this is one of my favorite memes, I use it everywhere, so. <laughs> that have happened in the past, but the really wonderful thing that I've learned from the community in my few years being in tech um, is that we're all striving for the same thing. The intention is there, and we really need to just gather um, marginalized folk and pair them with the resources to create those solutions. I think it's not a short, it's, there's a short journey to ultimately reaching a place where we can all have valid, real conversations about reimagining all of our online spaces that are deeply inclusive, deeply affirming, and ultimately safe and secure enough that anyone feels like they can access and use them. I think it's important to acknowledge that 
Um, safety hasn't been a priority on many platforms, and that's intentional, I think, for a reason. Because safety requires people to see people fully and acknowledge that everyone's needs may not be my own. And that's been drastically different from the narrative of tech up until this point. Um, one key example I, I have on the top of my head is Twitter. I think Twitter has been um, going back and forth with a lot of marginalized people in regards to safety and security on their platform, especially online harassment. And I think that um, when you don't inherently think about harassment could happen on Twitter, you don't design and plan for it. And so when we think about radical queer futures, we have to design and plan for the things automatically by assessing um, our differences, really being real about um, how people interact with each other and where those pain points come from. Um, to be open and honest in tech and really evaluate the ways that human beings have um, mistreated each other ultimately based on various marginalized identities and really putting that into the forefront of our discussions instead of a more technical aspect. Because I think at the end of the day, radical queer futures through tech is ultimately radical queer futures through our communities, through our homes, through our families and friends and connections. It's ultimately forcing us to evaluate um, who we are as a people, um, who we are as Americans, um, especially people of color in those various spaces and how we are creating things apart from just tech tools um, that allow us to see each other better. I think one thing that really inspired me to do this talk beyond anything is that there weren't any spaces previous to, I would say, the past two years that really have felt affirming um, for both being black and queer. And to realize that there was such a gap, yet black and queer people have been around literally for the <laughs> existence of this earth, yet um, we're asking to be seen and asking to be present. And I think that's um, a testament to just how much work there is to be done. It's exciting because there are a lot of people who are paying attention and realizing that there is a big chasm between where we are currently and what we could be. Um, and are willing to do that work to really invest the time in those very spaces, in those groups. So we're at the very forefront of what a radical queer future through tech could be. So we have various programs that are supporting marginalized youth in different communities, that are supporting marginalized people, um, not just in the US and the Western world, but in various countries that might have been um, denied access to various tools based on language barriers. Why are most things in English? I think that's strange. Um, or just the lack of uh, actual space, both financial um, and literal, to create their own access, uh, create their own tools to provide access to their own communities. I think that the gap um, really is centered in colonial practice that we continue to replicate through tech. Um, the ways in which we ask for resources from larger companies who have had them based on um, historic hiring inadequacies or, um, yeah, general discrimination against people who are, might be different from like the typical white tech bro and how that manifests in our communities and our spaces and ultimately in the way people interact with each other across the world. I think to think about um, the web of how that all flows and how dangerous it is that a few group of white men in one area of the world can really influence the broader scale of how people across this planet interact with each other, I think is a critical point we need to really focus on and shift that dynamic of. Um, because it ultimately, without the responsibility, without the acknowledgement, without the recognition of who's controlling what and for what reasons, I think we'll continue uh, the pattern of seeing that marginalized folk are being pushed to the side to um, ultimately enhance an industry that won't serve them. So when I think about a radical queer future that um, really embraces everyone, it's ultimately talking about um, steps to both financial, literal, spiritual, emotional revolution that are through tech. So tech ultimately, if successful, allows us to connect better and it isn't the center or isn't the focal point of that change. I know that's a lot, there's a lot of work. Um, but I think it's possible. I think that, especially for the folks I met in the Bay, um, we're already at a turning point where we can acknowledge that there's some larger dissonance, there's too much violence that's happening both on interpersonal scale um, in regards to harassment and on a larger scale in our communities um, that needs to be addressed. So I hope you'll join me continue this conversation. This was simply an entry point into a much larger dialogue or discourse, but um, I thank you for your time.